الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وبعد سلام عليكم ورحمة الله The eighth act which invalidates a fast is the act of vomiting intentionally regardless of whether it is for a medical purpose or a non-medical purpose. So if a person intentionally vomits, it will invalidate his fast. If a person unintentionally vomits or forgetfully vomits, forgets that he's fasting in the month of Ramadan, then it does not invalidate his fast. One of the questions that may arise here is, is a person allowed to burp if they think that by doing so, some food may enter their mouth? Let's say right after suhoor, they've eaten quite a bit, and now they've started the fast of the month of Ramadan for a fast, and they realize that if they were to burp, some food would come into their mouth. Are they allowed to do that or not? And the answer is, yes, they are allowed to do that, as long as it's considered to be a burp and not vomiting. Then if something comes into their mouth, they have to remove it, they can't swallow it. The ninth thing that invalidates a fast in the month of Ramadan is the act of causing thick dust or thick particles to enter the throat. Whether these particles are usually eaten, like for example flour, if somebody is doing some work with flour and there's thick flour in the air and they breathe it in, or it's something that's not usually eaten. For example, they're cleaning the vacuum cleaner, there's a lot of thick dust that comes out of it, they go and breathe that and that enters their throat, it will invalidate their fast. And based on this particular ruling, therefore our scholars say that smoking or using shisha during the day will also invalidate a fast based on obligatory precautions. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'd like to begin today's discussion by talking about shaitan, the nature of shaitan, and the role that shaitan or Satan plays in our individual lives in our family and community lives. One of the things that is most misunderstood is the concept of shaitan in Islam. Our understanding of Islam or our understanding of shaitan is a cultural understanding or a traditional understanding. And this cultural understanding is plagued with questions, plagued with objections, plagued with doubts. And we have to replace our cultural understanding with a Qur'ani understanding. Because in the Qur'ani understanding, you will not find objections or doubts about the concept of shaitan. So one of the questions that often gets asked is, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even create shaitan? Life would have been much better if God would not have created shaitan. There would have been no wars in this world if God would not have created shaitan. I would not commit sins if God did not create shaitan, there would be no feuds within the family, no conflicts within the family, because one of the things that shaitan does is he creates hatred and enmity amongst the believers. There would be no feuds within the family if God had not created shaitan. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create shaitan? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created two types of volitional creatures. Creatures who have a free will. The first is the human being. And Allah created human being from clay. And the second is the jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the jinn from fire, right? If you remember the story of Prophet Adam and Iblis, خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارْ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ طِينَ He created, uh, you created me from fire, you created him from clay. The purpose of creating human beings is so that they come to know who God is, and they come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purpose of creating the jinn, the same purpose that human beings have. The jinn, all of them, have the same purpose in their existence that human beings have. Our purpose is to understand God, 
their purpose is also to understand God. Our purpose in life is to worship God. Their purpose in their lives is also to worship God. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn, nor have I created mankind, except for the purpose of worshipping me. Then amongst the jinn you find, there are two types of jinn. There are jinn who are righteous, and there are jinn who are not righteous. Once the Prophet of Allah went to the city of Ta'if, because the people of Mecca were not recipient to the message of the Holy Prophet. And he went to the bazaar of the Uqqas over there. And the people of Ta'if even did not want to listen to the message of the Holy Prophet. So the Prophet on his way back from Ta'if passed by a valley. And it was nightfall, so the Prophet decided to remain in that valley. And that valley is famously known as the Valley of the Jinn. And the Prophet had a practice that in the night he would recite verses of the Qur'an. And usually he would recite the Qur'an whilst he was praying. So he was reciting certain verses of the Qur'an when the jinn heard him reciting those verses. And when they heard the verses, they were amazed by it. And they brought faith in the Holy Prophet. And not only brought faith in the Holy Prophet, they took the message of the Prophet, the verses that they heard, they went back to their community of the jinn, and they went back to do tabligh to them, to teach them as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures the scene in the Qur'an. He says, قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا O Prophet, tell them, it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn heard the Qur'an and when they heard the Qur'an, they said, we have heard an amazing recitation. يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْدِ فَآمَنَّا بِهِ it guides towards the right path. It guides us towards our growth. So we've brought faith in it. And we're not going to associate any partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These were jinn who are believing jinn. But then they also point out in their conversation that jinn are of two types. There are those who are righteous and then there are those who are not righteous. وَأَنَّا مِنَّا الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّا دُونَ ذَلِكَ Amongst us are those who are righteous, who believe in Allah, who do the right things, and amongst us are those who are not righteous. In fact, there are those who misguide other people. There are those who take people away from the right path. These jinn who are not righteous, who take people away from the right path, these jinn are known as shayateen. They are known as shaytan. And the word shaytan comes from the word shatana. And shatana means to be distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this group of jinn, which misguide other people, their leader is a jinn by the name of Iblis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create a shaytan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created jinn. He gave them the same purpose that He has given to us as well. Some of those jinn, they chose to become shaitan. God did not create a shaitan. That's a very important distinction. And therefore you find in the Quran that not only the jinn are considered to be shaitan, sometimes when a human being misguides another human being, despite knowing the right path, that human being is also called as a shaitan in the Quran. Min sharr al-waswas al-khannas al-ladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al-nas مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ شَيَاطِينَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ That clarifies the first point. The second point. So what role does shaitan play in our lives? What can he do to us? And what can't he do to us? And there are so many stories and folklores that go around the whole concept of shaitan and jinn. They can possess human beings. They can force human beings to do certain things. They can make human beings sick. They can make human beings become, you know, uh, uh, um, create psychological problems for human beings. They can cause enmity between people. They can cause hatred between people. They can cause a husband and a wife not to love each other. These are things that we have heard in our traditions. It doesn't matter which tradition you come from. It doesn't matter which culture you come from. In all of our cultures, these things have been mentioned. So let me make one thing very clear. The jinn and shaitan can do none of these things. He can't force you to do anything. He can't possess you. He can't cause sickness within you. 
He can't force you to hate somebody. If you don't want to hate that person, He can't force you to love somebody if you don't want to love that person. Hujjat al-Islam Tahriri, who is a scholar in Iran, he says, based on two reasons, this is not possible. First, he says, it goes against the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, he says, it also goes against the text of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes for us the day of judgment, a scene on the day of judgment. And he says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ And shaitan would say, when all is said and done, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ God made you a promise. He told you, if you stay on the right path, I'll send you to paradise. And if you do wrong, then you will face hellfire. And I made a promise to you as well. I told you not to worry about the hereafter. I told you not to worry about other human beings. I told you not to worry about ethics. I told you to be individualistic and nothing wrong will happen to you. I made a promise to you as well. But I broke my promise to you. وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ But don't think I forced you to do anything. I didn't. I had absolutely no authority over you. I couldn't possess you. I couldn't make you do anything. Then how did you make us do these things? إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I only invited you. The only thing that shaitan can do, remember this, the only thing that shaitan can do is he can plant a thought into your mind. He can sow a thought in your mind and nothing more than that. Just as human beings can also put thoughts into your mind, shaitan also puts thoughts into our mind. But we don't realize that it's shaitan who's doing that. Allah tells us in the Quran that shaitan and his group, they can see you from a position where you can't see them. So sometimes a thought comes to your mind. You think it is me thinking shaitan is putting the thought into your mind. And thoughts are of two types. There are thoughts which are known as shaitani, satanic inspirations, and there are thoughts which are known as rahmani, angelic inspirations. I just put a thought into your mind. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ On this day, I've got my own problems. Don't blame me. You blame yourself now. Shaitan can't force us to do uh, anything. But shaitan can put a thought into your minds. He can promise us certain things. He can make us fear certain things. Or make us want to fear certain things. Let me give you an example. Whenever you have an opportunity to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes a thought comes to your mind, if I give sadaqah, then what about me? What about my children? What if I need this money tomorrow? What if there is an emergency tomorrow and I need this money and I'm giving it away in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is satanic thinking. Allah tells us in the Qur'an, الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرَ وَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَى Shaitan promises you poverty, puts the thought of poverty into your mind. And not only that, but he encourages you to do that which is indecent. What is that? You know, he tells you not to spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, he tells you use this money to, have to enjoy yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying yourself. But he says, use this money to enjoy yourself. There's no need to spend in the way of Allah. Or if you want to give in the way of Allah, give those things that you don't need. Those clothes that you've used up, those toys that you don't need, the children don't need, give those away, right? Why do you have to give the things that you need in the way of Allah? Whenever we have an opportunity to do good, shaitan promises us two things, and Allah promises us two things. Shaitan promises us poverty, and encourages us to do wrong. وَاللَّهُ يَعِدُكُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَرَحْمَةً مَغْفِرَةً وَفَضْلًا And God promises you forgiveness in the hereafter. And God promises that He will increase for you in this world as well. Think about it. Shaitan tells you when you spend in the way of Allah, you've lost what you've spent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you when you spend in the way of God, you've gained what you've spent. It is narrated that once in the house of the Prophet, there was a sacrificial animal. They sacrificed a sheep. And any time somebody came to the Holy Prophet for some help, the Prophet said to him, Why don't you go to my house, to one of the houses of my wife, and she will give you something. So the whole day people had been going to that house to take something from the Qurbani. At the end of the day, after Salatul Isha, it seems, the Prophet of Allah comes home, and he sits down for dinner, and his wife brings him a piece of the leg. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, only this has remained. The whole day people came home 
and they took away from the Qurbani and only this has remained. The Prophet said, you're mistaken. Everything has remained, only this is going to be lost. Now, all shaitan can do is put a thought into our minds. Now, what does shaitan do within a family? What does shaitan do within a community? One of the goals of shaitan within a community is to create hatred, is to create enmity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran, shaitan does not like a sense of community, he doesn't like a healthy family either. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُوْقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ وَيَسُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Two things which are not permissible in Islam. The first is consuming alcohol and the second is gambling. Now, there are a number of reasons for why consumption of alcohol is not allowed. The primary reason is because it compromises your aql. And there are a number of reasons for why gambling is not allowed. But one of the reasons mentioned in this verse is we're told alcohol and gambling is not allowed because it leads to enmity, it leads to hostility, it leads to animosity, right? Somebody consumes alcohol and, and sometimes they're, they're drunk, they're intoxicated and they start saying things which lead to enmity. They start doing things which create problems within the family. People who gamble, sometimes they become so addicted to gambling they don't have time for their family. They use up all the assets of their family. They become very depressed. Creates conflict within the family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, shaitan uses these two tools to create conflict within the family. And one of the questions that we may have is, can we understand why alcohol is not allowed? And we understand why gambling is not allowed. But explain to us why is it that I cannot sit at the same table where alcohol is being served? As you know, Sitting at the same table where alcohol is being served is not allowed. And eating from the table is not allowed either. Why is it that I can't play with the tools of gambling? As you know, a deck of 52 cards, even if there's no money being wagered, no bet being put down, just playing with a deck of 52 cards because it's a tool of gambling is not allowed. Why is that not allowed? So shaitan is very smart. Shaitan knows that if he comes today and tells you to go and consume alcohol, you won't do that. If he comes and tells you today to gamble hundreds of dollars, you're not going to do that. But Shaitan gets us accustomed to it step by step. He tells you first, why don't you go and sit at the restaurant, you're not consuming the alcohol, you're not getting drunk, you're just around alcohol, there's nothing immoral about it. Once you get used to the smell of alcohol, to looking at alcohol, then he says, what's wrong with spiking your drink? You're not getting drunk, are you? Getting drunk is immoral, but just tasting it is not immoral. Once you get accustomed to that, and you're okay with that idea, then Shaitan comes and tells you, well, getting drunk once in a while, social drinking, what's the problem with that? The same goes with gambling. And a person who gambles, even if he's not putting any money down, after a while Shaitan comes and tells him, wouldn't it be more fun if you put down 25 cents? You're not you know, throwing away a whole bank balance here, it's just 25 cents. And after a while you get used to that idea and it says, wouldn't it be more fun if you put some more money down? Therefore you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a number of concepts and practices, He doesn't tell us don't do it, He tells us stay away from it, right? This is shaitan working. Now, shaitan tries to create hatred within brothers and sisters, create animosity within them. How does he do that? Can he make us hate each other? He can't. If we don't want it, he can't do it. Can he make us enemies of each other? If we don't want that, he can't do it. All he can do is put a thought into our mind. Right? For example, he makes us look at defects in each other. Find defects in each other. Right? And therefore he finds sometimes, and he's very persistent with that. You know, we're always looking for defects in other people instead of looking at defects within ourselves. And there comes a time when you look at a defect over and over again in a person, then you don't think that person has anything good in them. You only think of defects from that person. Sometimes it happens that a person will come to me and they will complain about their member of their family. And they'll say, this person, they can't do this. They have this defect. They failed at doing this. They are like this. They have done this. And I say, okay, very well, that's fine. But now, but you also remember that this person 
They have these skills, they have this expertise, they have done this for you, they have achieved this in their life, they have sacrificed this for you, they have helped in the community. And you have a pause over there. They pause and they realize they haven't been looking at the good things in that person. What else can shaitan do? Shaitan can make us suspicious of each other. Judge each other. Make assumptions about each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to make assumptions about each other. So let's say a person's late coming home. You've got two choices over here. Your first choice is to make bad assumptions about that person. They're home, they're late at home because they don't care about the family. They don't care about me. They don't want to spend time with me. Or the other assumption that you can make is to say they're late because there was traffic. Because they had some extra work to do. So here there are two concepts. And let's see what Islam is asking us to do. In the Arabic language, the word dhan means thought. And the word husnul dhan means to have a good opinion about somebody. Islam wants us to have a good opinion of life in general. And Islam wants us to have a good opinion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one hadith from the set, from the eighth holy imam, Imam al Ridha alayhi yaftalu salati wa salam. He says, Have a good opinion about God. Especially when you're praying to God, have a good opinion about God. Especially when you're going through difficulties in your life, have a good opinion about God. Why? Because God says Himself, I treat my servant the way He thinks for me. In khayran fa khayran wa in sharran fa sharran. If he thinks good of me, that's exactly how I treat him. If he thinks I'm going to answer his prayer, if that's how he thinks about me, then I answer his prayer. If he thinks that I'm going to take care of him, he thinks of me as a merciful Lord, then that's exactly how I'm going to be with him. Wa in sharran fa sharran. If he thinks I'm not going to answer his prayers because I don't care about him, because I'm not merciful towards his servant, then I don't answer his prayer. We've got to have a good opinion about God. We also have to have a good opinion about our brothers and sisters. This is called husnul dhan. Opposite to that is another concept. It's called su'ul dhan. What's su'ul dhan? It's to have a bad opinion about somebody. It's to be suspicious about somebody. It's to make assumptions about somebody that are not true. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuha alladheena aamanu ijtanibu kathiran min al-dhanni O those who believe, avoid a lot of suspicion. Avoid a lot of this negativity that you have about other people. Why? Inna ba'da al-dhanni ithmun Some of these thoughts that you have, they're sins. Some of these thoughts that you have, they're sins. Which ones? فَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And do not spy upon each other. Sometimes these thoughts that you have, they cause you to spy upon each other. How? You read each other's emails, you read each other's texts, you look into each other's lives, you ask about each other. Islam does not like us spying upon each other. Right? You know when we talk about the, the mistakes, the sins of the eyes, sometimes we think that the only sin that the eye can make is to look at a non-mahram lady, to look at a lady that you're not allowed to look at, or for a lady to look at a man, for example. Some of our scholars say, no, there are up to 15 sins that the eye can commit. For example, looking at a righteous person with the eyes of anger. Looking at your parents with the eyes of anger. Looking at an oppressor with the eyes of love and affection. Looking into a person's letters or looking into his house when you're not supposed to be looking into his house. That's also a sin that the eye commits. All right? And do not spy upon each other. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And do not backbite each other. Now just imagine the sequence of ideas in the Qur'an. I told you before that the sequence of ideas is very important in the Qur'an. Number one, it says, اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن Avoid suspicion. Why? Because when you have suspicion, what are you going to do? You're going to start spying upon each other. Let me find out if this is true or not. When you spy upon each other, what will happen? You might find out something. Or you might become suspicious about something. You want to tell somebody. You want to share with somebody. You want to backbite, right? So, what does the Quran tell us? From the roots, 
avoid having suspicion about each other. To the contrary, in the hadith we're told, Interpret all the actions of your brother in faith in the best of manners. If you can interpret it positively, interpret it positively. Until you achieve evidence, you receive evidence that doesn't allow you to interpret it positively. So let's say now, somebody made a decision in a committee. Somebody made a decision in the family and they did not consult you. You got two options here. First option that you have is to have a negative opinion about them. They did not consult me because they don't care about me. Because they don't care about my opinion. They did not consult me because they don't care about anybody's opinion. This person is authoritarian. This person is a dictator, for example. This is a shaitani part. The other option that you have is to give them an excuse. And in some of the hadith it is reported, give your brother 70 excuses before you accuse him of something. You know? Maybe they were stressed. Maybe they forgot. Maybe they didn't have time. Now, this sort of an attitude doesn't come overnight. Okay? Let's say if a person has the habit of being suspicious, they can't change themselves overnight. One thing we find very difficult to control are our thoughts. And we're not going to be able to control our thoughts overnight. In order to change our thoughts, we actually have to change our nature. And our nature doesn't change overnight. It takes effort. It takes hard work. And it takes time to develop. So let's say I have a nature that's not good. I'm not patient, I'm not forbearing, I'm suspicious, or let's say I'm miserly, I'm not generous, right? How do I change that? I'm not gonna be able to control my thoughts. But our scholars point out, I can control my actions. So if I'm suspicious, let me not act upon my suspicion. If I'm suspicious, let me not spy upon another person. If I'm suspicious, let me not share my thoughts with somebody else. If I'm suspicious, let me not judge that person. Let me not start ignoring that person. I can't control my thoughts, but I can control my actions. Right? Not only that, they point out that we are able to admonish ourselves. You're able to talk to yourself. Now let's say you come across a brother and you're thinking about him and suddenly you have a suspicious thought about him, or you start seeing defects in that person, rather than seeing you know, their good qualities within them. So what do you do? You admonish yourself. You talk to yourself. You say to yourself, you're looking at defects in this person, don't you have the same defects within yourself? You're looking at the defects that they have, don't you see that they have good traits as well? And you start focusing on that. This is going to be a battle. A battle between the intellect and my desires. A battle between the intellect and my heart. But this is the jihad. When the Prophet of Allah talks about al-jihad al-akbar, the major jihad, this is the jihad. It's a jihad between the intellect and my desires. It's a jihad that happens within me and not outside of me. Right? And this is what we need to do. If we want to build our character, we'll have to do jihad. If we want to build our character, we're going to have to consciously put effort into building our character. I'm going to have to talk to myself. I'm going to have to stop myself from doing certain things. And inshallah, over time, your nature will change and become a Rahmani nature instead of being a Shaitani nature. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this evening, in the holy month of Ramadan. Ya Allah, we have fasted for one-third of the holy month of Ramadan, we ask you to accept our acts of worship and our fasting in this month of Ramadan. Ya Allah, if we have lacked in sincerity, if we have lacked in effort, Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us and we ask you to give us the strength to improve upon our actions and to improve upon our sincerity. Ya Allah, we pray to you that all the prayers that we have made in the month of Ramadan and those that we will make, Ya Allah, we implore you to answer our prayers. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive our sins. Ya Allah, we ask you for all those who are sick, those who are in difficulty, those who are suffering in different parts of the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to alleviate their suffering, to grant them a complete and a quick recovery, and to bring peace, harmony, and to bring um, peace and harmony back to their lives. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Wow. Wow.